<laughs> I mean, that camera is like way slanted. <laughs> I'll fix it in post. Fuck it. <laughs> so you don't have to slope. Recording, 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 and we're in. Let's Sweet. go. Let's Thanks do for it. joining me again. I feel like this is, oh, this is the third one we've done, but I lost Technically the Technically third one. one, yeah. <laughs> when I lost my project and my hard drive and everything that was on it, I lost, and it was filmed as well. Yeah, it was interesting because I was thinking about it. And it's funny how you have a discu discussion and have no recollection of like yeah, right. what, what you even said. It's nice to know we both pay attention to each other. <laughs> Maybe it's because we rely on the recording. Like, oh, you know, it's it's recorded. So if I ever need to access that information, I'll just yeah, listen yeah. to it. Um but maybe, hopefully, we're both in a space now where something will stick and we'll be able to remember it. I do remember actually quite a bit from the first conversation that we had. And I do remember a little bit we talked about perfection on the second one yeah and i do remember i feel like we had some good things to say about that but we'll start in the same place that we always start and that is the question what even is art art to me is self-expression so whatever means that is whether it's coffee or you know you have a specific take on ceramics i think it's just your own means of expressing yourself and defining what how you see the world and how you see yourself in the world <laughs> and that that's not something that's changed since the first time we spoke f three or four years ago that's pretty much the the same answer that you gave last time which is good nice to know that it still means the same thing for you and that's like a almost like a truth that's held strong over all these years which is great how does that definition of self-expression translate to when you are an audience of somebody else's work how do you go to a gallery and look at a painting or see a sculpture or like the ceramic heart that you bought recently or listen to somebody else's music or watch somebody else's film how do you interpret it their self-expression and use and how does it become something that's applicable and useful to you I think it's interesting because I think art in itself like mirrors what just like emotions and those emotions can be translated to yourself. So I think that's kind of what I kind of not necessarily look for, but I think you see art or you experience art like going to a gallery. Like I've had so many intense like reactions to art, but I've also had some very like blank reactions where people are like, oh, this guy, this exhibition is insane. You have to see it. And I go, I'm like, I just don't get it at all. And that's not to say that it takes away from whatever experience that person had, but I think it's how I see myself in something else. Mm. And I think a lot of the times, especially with buying a ceramic or like whatever it is, a piece of art or listening to music, I think it's the emotional reaction tends to come from how I see myself in this piece of work. And as well, like, I don't know, specifically more to music. I think I love like daring production, but I love more than anything honesty and I love um, something that I can feel like someone's unveiling, unveiling something to me in a way that feels really pure. Mm. Um, so I think that's what's amazing about art is that you kind of get the opportunity to like tap into someone else's world. Mm. That's interesting. I've read a bit of Carlos Castaneda here and there and... Uh, a book I'm reading at the moment, Active Side of Infinity or Eternity, one of the two. It's a, essentially a master and a student relationship. And the student is writing something. He's like, express yourself. And the student brings him something and the master goes, not good enough. And he never tells him why. And he's like, try again. He's like, go in deeper. And the student brings him something and the master is like, not good enough go deeper and the, the the kid just doesn't get it because he doesn't know what he's supposed to be doing so he's yeah. just doing all of the things that he thinks he should be doing and the master essentially goes you, you, you're so wrapped up in yourself that I can't even access this this is so much 
to do with you and it's so personal that it, and it's so insular that I'm cut off from it. Go in and find a universal truth in your pain, in whatever it is that you're expressing and then bring it back. So the, the guy goes away and obviously it takes a few more uh, layers of, of um, distillation. But eventually he brings something that brings the master to tears. And the whole point of that is that, yeah, it's self-expression in as much as it's self-exploration of where you can go in and bring something mm. universal out. And I think that for me is the um, point of differentiation, I guess, with the art being self-expression. Because if you go too far one way of the self-expression, then it almost becomes impenetrable for other people. And uh, my favorite song of yours, Does It Bring You Shame, I Hang My Head in the Moonlight. You know, there's a, there's a version of that song that exists, I think, that isn't so universally true isn't so pure and so honest and i think there's a there's a process that one has to go through of stripping back the self from the work so that anybody else it can pour into anybody else yeah i think that's why i find the kind of feedback or the kind of relationship with a producer really important mm. and I found that with this new record like I had the similar experience with Alex who basically produced a new record and a lot of the times like I'd be recording vocals and he'd come say to me like I feel like you can do better with these two lines I think you can get a better two lines that kind of expresses exactly what you feel in that moment in that song and what you want to feel and I've never had anyone do that to me before kind of challenge me in what it is that I'm expressing mm. in the song and kind of made me think back and be like okay what do I do and then kind of instinctively just kind of found naturally a new lying or I don't know a new way of singing a lying that felt like so much like more potent so I think it's really interesting because obviously making music is so insular and it can be like I don't know, battle with yourself and your headspace and, you know, your ideals of yourself. And a lot of it feels like you're on the, the cusp of something that is like revolutionary. But in at the end of the day, like it is like interesting when you play something to someone else and it can be really strange. You play something to someone else and you're like, mm. they have this reaction and it kind of throws you off. Mm. And I think that's what's been so amazing about I think making music is sharing that music with someone else and having someone see me like beyond what I see in myself and bringing out those kind of universal kind of truths as well. Well, it's interesting when a producer will say you can do better because better is subjective in that sense. But what does better mean? You're saying that there's a potency to whatever you make next. What is it that brings that potency? What is it that uh, you talk about when we say better? I think it's basically like trying to trying to evoke the emotion that you want to and actually daring to go there. And I've experienced that so much recently. Um, well, not just with the record, but with like making the new music video. And I had like a movement coach and he was kind of like, we played around with different, just to get me in the headspace of like emotionally what I want to give off in this video. And he was just like, what is really stopping you from letting go and just actually doing, being vulnerable enough or being playful enough or being really silly or looking crazy or sounding like a mad woman? And why won't you go there? And I think it's that point where you have to go there. You have to dare to do that. And I think that's what um, Alex brought out in me in this record because he was like, I sung in ways I've definitely never <laughs> sung before and pushed myself. And he was like, you have to sing that harder. You have to go harder. Think about what you're saying in the song. Like, how how do you bring that f across? And I was like, it was frustrating at times to track some vocals because it was like, it almost felt like a workout. I was like, mm. okay, I don't Acrobatics. think I can sing this anymore kind of a thing. And then when we got there, it was like, holy shit, like, okay, I, I totally get it. And there's songs that I definitely, you know, tweaked lyrics and got that kind of hit, you know, across that border that sometimes is really hard to to want to do because 
it's like a very vulnerable place. Mm. Or, um, but I think it's important. I have to remember in my mind two places I want to take this now. But the first place is with uh, your movement coach. What was it that was stopping you from moving freely? Well, mostly because I think I was always like this kind of artist artist where I kind of didn't necessarily think about anything beyond just music. And for me, m me letting go was in my like, music. Yeah. And I never really questioned the concepts of trying something new because I was always in unhinged in sonically like what you know where where I could go or like musically like trying a new instrument but movement wise it's kind of weird because I felt like if I do something that's a little bit unorthodox I feel like there's suddenly a million people in the room and everyone's watching me so it's kind of just this I don't know it's this uncomfortable zone in my head that I kind of needed to cross to then kind of move forward even with just like music videos in general the concept of music video used to terrify me when I first came out and being filmed was really strange because there was is that nervousness of like I don't know what I don't know what I look like to other people which is strange because like in my music I don't care yeah. like I kind of will just go there and try something new so it was like an important chapter like it just got really deep because he sat me down and was like is there a specific moment in your life where you you know you felt like oh shit this guy needs a podcast <laughs> <laughs> and it felt like therapy it was kind of crazy it was like he went to this kind of like point in my head where I was like so stuck on that so afraid of trying something new in like image wise and it unlocked something for me that I think I'll take forward with this record yeah well it's something that's uh perceptible in the video I think I even replied to you when the video came out like it's amazing to see you move in different yeah different and new ways and that's kind of how I felt about your last record as well in a sense of how you sounded like it was just uh beautiful to hear how the sound of you has changed and how you're able to articulate yourself differently yeah differently yeah. Which is amazing that the point of that of all of it, even just down to the movement, is communication and being able to articulate yourself. And it's interesting that sonically you're able to communicate what it is you want to communicate. But then when it comes to another domain, which is physicality, the the hang ups are still there. Yeah. You would just assume, wouldn't you, that well, sonically I'm liberated and I'm able to put myself completely naked into these songs. So why can't I do it in a in a dance or in a, visually? It's it's tricky, but I don't know why that is there. I think that's maybe like the younger part of my brain that was like this naivety about I don't know art in itself and just being this like purist and just being about music. You know, when I was younger and not necessarily seeing myself in that context or understanding the capabilities of it, and I felt like from touring with like like subtracts or like so many different artists, seen so many shows, I've learned how like how you control like um, the visual and how you present certain things is like a beautiful thing. It's like incredible what you can do, incredible emotionally what you can evoke. But like FKA Twigs, like Yeah. I saw a recent show and it was like insane. Yeah. Like she's like it's almost like a theatre show because she's, you know, tap dancing in the beginning and it's like doing all these crazy things. But I think it's really magical that world that you suck people in. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like a Beyonce moment. <laughs> it could be in, you know, like for instance, like the whole Bonnie Bear thing, he does this whole thing with like mirrors a light and, and yeah. mirrors and stuff. Like that is movement in a sense. It's the same kind of thing. So it's kind of seeing yourself in that world and how you bring that to life and just daring to make that first step into it I think is something that I'm like so much more interested in this time around. How has it affected your process then stepping out into the unknown and revealing a world of possibilities to yourself how does that then affect the process of creation moving forward? I think for me my brain is just more visually like um I don't know like my imagination I feel like I've tapped into like I close my eyes or even when I'm making a song like 
I visualise myself like performing it on a stage or like performing it in a setting. Like, how would I do that? Like, what um, what kind of stuff will I, you know, do? Or like, um, especially like um, musical direction as well. Mm. Like, I think about visually, what would this look like on stage? Or um, more film. I, I'm like such a film geek I love film and I think about the visuals of like how how can I translate this into a music video or like a live performance and my mind is kind of much more like I think about the whole kind of picture like 3d image mm. well it's something I've actually started to do recently as well with music whenever I get stuck I just go, all right, let me stop thinking about this like it's a song. Let me start thinking about this like it's a scene in a film. What what happens next? And that's really helped me to get past my blocks, essentially, or my crew. Not, not necessarily blocks, it's indecision, I think, is the problem. Mm -hmm. But having more than one point of reference to be able to go, oh, well, musically, I can't, I can't, I can't find the shape in my mind or I can't find the next step. So let me just log out of that. Let me log into if this were a film or yeah. I, I, don't, I, I haven't done explored any kind of physical movement or dance. So that's not something that I necessarily have access to at the moment. But it sounds like you now have access to. Isn't it amazing just to be able to dip into these other perspectives and be like, oh, okay, now I can find my way out of a... Um, creative cul-de-sac mm. when you get to a crossroads of where you of, of where you're struck with a bit of indecision about what to do next how do you figure it out i kind of just step away from it <laughs> i think that's the biggest thing for me sometimes i feel like especially in music songs have its own lifespan and they kind of reveal themselves in like a different way and with this record there's some songs that like there's a song called hail on the record that um, I did like when I was like 21. I wrote the song when I was 21. Um, so it's like five years old and there's so many versions of it. And it was always really frustrating because I was like, I've never been able to figure it out. I've never even been able to tell the story slash emotion of this song. So I kind of just forgot about it and just didn't do anything. And I met my friend Quez on a very casual kind of tip, went to his house for a cup of tea. And we're just like, should we just start Hail from scratch? And just, you know, forget whatever we did before. And we started from scratch and like literally in about three hours, we captured the song like literally two years after we even recorded like everything. And I mean everything because we went to Abbey Road, it's like my birthday, and we recorded like every organ you can think of, roads, like, and it just didn't feel right. We just didn't hit the nail on the head. And this one moment in his bedroom, we just kind of got the song right. Well, what's happening there? What do you think is happening that's enabling that to happen? Because I think it's like, I really do think um, projects have a mind of their own and things happen. It's almost like the universe is like, you know, it, it's like fate in a way. I don't know. Like they have their own kind of script written in a sense and they will reveal themselves to you in a, in their own way. I think it's important to know when to step away from them and to come back because, you know, your headspace with the song now is going to be very different to your headspace in, in a week's time or even a month. And that's something that I learned a lot making this record. Like me and Alex, um, the first two songs we did, uh, To the Brink was the first one, but um, it was like a very urgent, urgent thing there and it was really immediate and it felt really right. But then the third song we did, um, we spent all day basically just frustrating ourselves because we just couldn't get it right. And we just like, okay, scrap this song. We're not going to look at this song for like a month. And then in a month's time, we listened to it. First of all, we listened to it. We're like, wait a second, this is really fresh. This is like actually really cool. Right at the time, we're like, mm, it doesn't seem right. And all we had to do is kind of focus on individual parts and just maybe mute a few things and redo a few things and but I think that perspective shift was like really important so I think that's what I've learned there's songs that I love that actually aren't on the record but I feel like it's not it's not it's the time yet it's not the right time for them and I think maybe in the fourth record or who knows you know like they'll have their moment when I get to them 
but I've written them and recorded them and they're not really, it's not there yet. I don't think it's delivering what I want it to, to be. So I think that's what's been important for me. That's what I've learned to like, just allow songs to almost make themselves in a way. Mm. It's an amazing thing when you revisit something you thought you didn't like and then you listen to it and you're like, well, I was tripping out that day. What <laughs> the fuck was going on? This is so good. Yeah. And I wonder what it is that's stopping us from uh, appreciating what it is in the moment. I don't know. I really don't know. I think it's a weird thing. I think our ears just get tired of hearing whatever it is. And I think that, I don't know, your brain of just wanting to get something right away um, kind of stops you from like enjoying it for what it is. And I've definitely had that where like, you know, you're working on a song and you hear it a million times and you're just like, by the end of it, you like practically hate the song. Mm. <laughs> um, and you just kind of have to, I don't know, you just have to come back to it and see it in a different way. And I have that, I've had that recently. Yesterday I listened to like all my demos over the past like four years. I was like, ah, oh, this song, I completely forgot about it. But there's something here that I think maybe I should revisit the song and just start from scratch on it or something. Have you started like repurposing parts of songs and being like, not being afraid to kill off full songs in exchange for maybe like a line or a section or one instrument part of being like, well, this whole thing doesn't work in an, in and of itself. But if I bring this into what I'm working on, I'm really excited about over here, mm -hmm. then this it makes this so much stronger. Yeah, I mean, you have to let go of like, I think you have to let go of an idealized vision of what you thought a song would be because songs just kind of like are going to be what, you know, they're going to be. Some things work and some things don't. So I'm never afraid to just throw away <laughs> the like kind of basis. And that's kind of a theme for a lot of the songs, to be honest. Like I've got a song called Don't Close the Door that realistically was like a very, I don't know, it started off in my head. I really want it to be this like organ led, like emotional three part harmony vibe. And we just got down the line. We're like, nah, this is not the song. So we scrapped it and completely <laughs> started it again. And I, I've always, that's always been something that I've like, I've really learned. Like we've used to, we used to bloom. Um, I stopped playing guitar realistically and I had to re, I kind of came back to guitar when all the songs were kind of produced and wrote guitar parts in a different way because, you know, songs like Trickle and like, uh, Does It Get Easier were like all guitar led. And then we're just like, it's not right. It just doesn't feel right. So we just muted everything and just had a skeleton of a track. And we're like, okay, how do we do this now? And we kind of just were in the moment with the song. And I think that's what's important as opposed to like pushing a kind of an agenda on it. You shouldn't be afraid to like just go in and be like, okay, how do I revoice the chords or like whatever it is? You're like actually being present with the song as opposed to like, being in your head about what you what you idolize about it maybe mm. so how important is destruction in the process of creation i think it's pretty important because you have to like it's all about being present with with um with the song as well as like i don't know just breaking down every single barrier that is like in your way so a lot of it is destruction it's destruction of like I don't know what the gaze of other people and just really really honing in on like what the song should should be and what it kind of will will become um which is something that I yeah I've just I think it's the most important part of making music because otherwise you kind of just end up going in a, a loop of like and you're too afraid to just kill what is actually like stopping the song from progressing. I really like the idea of the definition of art as being the destruction of judgment. Just, just hearing, because I've never really thought about how necessary that is in the process or not necessary, just how that happens when you're making something good. Of yeah. You're destroying your presuppositions. You're destroying your ideals. You're destroying your idols. You're destroying the script, essentially. 
And then that makes me realize why art is so important in life in the first place, because it's that space, it's proof that it can be done, you know? But it's something that we speak about very often on this podcast, but this is the only thing that people really suffer with is the fear of not being strong enough to destroy it and live on after it. And I think the art becomes the relic of that, right? All good pieces of art, for me anyway, is has been like a very gentle and supportive whisper in my ear of like, do it, step into the unknown. Because <laughs> you might come out, come out with this, you might yeah. come out with that. You'll come out with something just as golden and just as true and just as you. And for me, that's quite a revelation to me. Yeah, it's, it's something that I think people don't really talk about enough. Like I think about this a lot, like validation and how much how much self-validation is important for music to like really hone in to exactly what you hear or how like and I do this especially with food as well because like a lot of the ideas that you have like you go through this spiel of like is this possible or like is this a real thing or like will people think this is crazy and it's like why not just go for it and try it and fuck whatever you know other people think because that's how you actually become really in touch with how you really feel about yourself and how you see the world and you have to be daring and you have to um express those things in whatever like vomit word vomit they kind of come out in or like um so I think that's what's really important is that self-validation and that's kind of what I look for in a producer as well like is being validated in the space and being feeling seen and also feeling like there's like an infinite like possibilities of like whatever it is and feeling unashamed of like trying something and it not working Mm. as well I think that nervousness has to kind of like not be present and that fear is like you know, has to be like, you have to throw it out of the window, which is why I love making about music because I think it's really funny um, because I've got so much footage of me like making music with Steph for like We Used to Bloom and we literally just look like children. <laughs> like we're just, we're just like, oh my God, yeah. And let's take this. And then I'm like, she brings in a new instrument and like, oh, like, let's try this. And like, I've never literally played it before. Like I played like a Thurman on We Used to Play. I just didn't really know what I was doing. But there's something really natural about how you do something before someone tries to explain it to you. Mm. So Instinct. Yeah, just the instincts that you that you naturally have. And that's what's exciting to me is like instinctively, what what do you what do you want to do right now? And there's a lot of that in the record, like I find myself like just entering this playful part of my brain. I'm like, okay, more so of singing actually on this on this album because I was like, okay, I'm gonna sing this specific part like this, and then this part I'm gonna like be a bit more like I don't know, angry, and then this part I want to have this, and I found myself tapping into like a very playful part of my brain, and I think you have to be in sync. You know, you have to be in the same headspace. And it's weird. I felt like Alex was reading my mind a lot of the times, like with To The Brink. Um, Like he had this like massive modular kind of, it kind of just looks like a, I don't know, like a space kind of. Spaceship with a bunch (laughs) of holes and cables. (laughs) With a lot of stuff in. And it was kind of like a lot of my vocals through there and just started making these hooky kind of things with the vocals but also with lots of other instruments and it was like oh yeah that sound like that's perfect wow like how did you get here and everything we're just kind of figuring it out as we go along and I think that's what's exciting it's like you know you're kind of on the same wave wavelength together and you're like exploring it and like pushing it and you're pushing it in yourself and it's really special when the combination of the both things happen and you find someone that brings out that side of your personality. What helps you connect to that inner child? So I think that's a, a real big obstacle for people. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's attached to like, the obstacle itself is attached to shame and all of the historical childhood psychoanalytical shit. But the there is a real, I sense it in myself some days, a real difficulty with 
accessing that child and giving it space to just express itself. I wonder if you have, a, a, I don't know whether it would be a ritual or if just a way of, of calling on her. I think we all instinctively have it. And I think just instinctively how you even make something. I think as a child, like you draw a painting and then everyone else around you is kind of wanting to understand what you drew. And in, it's just your instinct to choose, I don't know, write. You could, a kid could make a series of paintings or like drawings all in blue just because that's how they felt. But then everyone else around them would be like, are you really sad? Or like, why the colour blue? Why this? And realistically, it was just your natural instinct mm. to, to do that. So I think it's just tapping into that, which is which is hard. But I think... I don't know. I think you just have to have the power to like listen to that part of your brain and just dare to experiment. Is there anything you have to turn off in your mind? Yeah, the voices of like, I don't know, just the influence of other things. I think it's really easy, especially in music, to, I don't know, fall in the lines of trends and wanting to, I don't know, use soundscapes that are very similar to what's happening. And... Unfortunately, a lot of this industry is like based on, you know, what formulas. Is, what is popular now? Mm -hmm. And it's crazy that for instance, someone like Billie Eilish can like do something that I think in pop music was so refreshing. And I feel like now there's probably been loads of people that are now going to probably do something that's very I mean, similar yeah, to that. I heard her. something on BBC Radio <laughs> One the other day and I was like, Oh, this is Billie Eilish's new song not as good as our other stuff and then they're like and that is claire from sheffield and i was like what the yeah, fuck exactly it was insane the harmonies were like exactly the same and the delivery was exactly the same and no one was like no don't do that Be yeah you. but it's crazy because with her she just made this you know weird album with her brother mm. in the house that they grew up in and like they just made something that was just really fresh because they were just you know validating themselves in that context and I really respect people that kind of tap into that and choose to tap into that because it's so easy to do the completely you know to go down the other route um and I think that's why I like everything everything I think you know in all their projects they've they've always kind of been very daring sonically and I remembered hearing like uh cough cough from like uh I think it's their second record um, arc and was just like what is this like this is insane like this is I've never heard anything like this before and I think that's why I love like you know Jesus and like um, 808 and Heartbreaks and um, like St. Vincent and even like Kendrick I think I think there's something really amazing about what Kendrick has done and how he's managed to continually transform his sound like working with Thundercat and like but then making like a proper like you know hip-hop album with like Good Kid Mad City and I think that's kind of what inspires me more than anything is the constant just being unapologetic just being unapologetic and just you know going with whatever is like very your truth in that moment and that's what is like that's why I think is sick. Like, new St. Vincent record, I was listening to it on the way here. And. Wait, is there a most recent one then? It just came out today. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. But I think, it's imp I think it's important because I remember when she first came out and everyone's like, what is this like weird yeah. kind of shit? But I think that's how you when, you. when you're doing stuff like that, and a lot of people call it pretentious as well, which is like. I fucking hate that. Word. I find really interesting, like. Like, I mean, Kanye is Kanye and he has his own, like, qualms. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. He said a lot of kind of insane things. But what I've, like, what I find interesting is what people find pretentious. And, like, and I read I read this book recently um, called Pretentiousness and Why It Matters. Like, brilliant book. Um, and it was basically talking about how pretentiousness is never self-subscribed. Like, people that are deemed as pretentious, whether it's in art or music. Someone might look at FK Twig's first EP or like music video and find it so challenging because they've like never seen it before that they just automatically use the word pretentious. So I find that really 
interesting like when someone's just being themselves that the thing that people go to is just saying they're just being but i think the interesting thing about pretension is that basically what people are saying is that there's no depth to that why are you trying to make it so deep because that's the definition of pretension is adding a layer of depth that isn't necessarily there acting like something is more substantial yeah, yeah. than it is but then when if you deliver or you're communicating a, a universal truth or you know something that we can all share and that we all have in common whether it's about grand ideas of religion or whatever or even small intricate fears about ourselves and our places in the world and people go why are you pretending like that's deep it's it's such a projection of their own shallowness i think that's the thing about pretensions it, it would be luxurious for the world if they could sweep substance under the rug because no one would ever have to challenge themselves no yeah. one would ever have to grow no one would ever have to change no one would ever have to face death essentially and and I think that's what pretension does. It's never it's like you said, no one ever puts it on themselves. It's always a derogatory yeah. slur, and it's always to dismiss substance. It's it's that's. I mean, sometimes it's valid. You know, sometimes people can make so, like a grand show out of something that's. But that's more. It's more how people perceive things, though. Yeah, you know, it's well, it's a defense hard. mechanism. That's what yeah. I'm trying to say is that they're like, no, there's no depth there. It's just pretentious. Now let's carry on with this over here that only yeah. fulfills me on a surface level. So it's usually, again, like I think we're agreeing is a, is a fearful term. It's a term of dismissal, essentially. Yeah, and I think some people kind of I, will identify something in themselves. Like they'll say something that is maybe a little bit unorthodox and be like, oh, like... Is that like really pretentious of me to think that? Is that really arrogant of me to think that? And it's where that we have that like stigma within ourselves to be like, is this too bold? <laughs> Do you have that? Well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. But you, but yeah, it's common. It's common, but it's interesting. It's interesting because you don't think about that in that way. Like you don't. You make something and you don't. You're not even thinking about. It. That's the last thing on your mind. And you know, it's interesting what people you know, this would describe as being pretentious. Yeah. And that's kind of what a lot of people stumble on with Kanye. It's like, well, he's just really arrogant and pretentious. I'm like, is... Well, the the thing... Have you heard Jesus is King? Yeah. <laughs> Do you like it? There's some cool... Like, there's some cool production on it, but I didn't think it was, like, amazing. I really love it. I really love it. There's like a few songs. The one with Ty Dolla Sign is really cool. Water? No. Water's really good. Water's incredible. Water's really good. Um, Ty Dolla Sign. Ty Dolla we, we got everything on, we need? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's very Kanye, you know. And I've always, I think... <laughs> I think what I like about him is that he is quite unhinged with his art. And he's very like, what as well, he, he talks about his frustrations, which I don't think anyone talks about. No one's transparent about like the struggles that they have. People always make something and want to pretend like it was the easiest shit in the world yeah. to come to. And I like the concept that he's like, you know, with the fashion world or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I kind yeah. of like that kind of, you know, that expression of just being like telling it how it is, how he got to these points or whatever. So I've always really respected that part of Kanye. And I think, to be honest, most musicians that I talk to, they like really want to have a Jesus moment. They want to have this moment where they're just like, fuck it, I'm just going to do whatever it is that I want to do and make, you know, and be unhinged. And I think there's a reason why a lot of artists like really appreciate him because I think he's, he's, he's like, a, you just don't know what's going to come out of his mouth, to be honest. Mm. But also he's, he just kind of like, I don't know, he speaks his mind and he just expresses himself in a very, like, incredible way that I think's Im been important for art and it makes art interesting True. as well. I think the thing that I've taken from this most recent record about him himself is that th you have to toe the line between, like, all-out splat, crazy unhinged like just let it all out no matter what it is and also like uh 
sculpting and finesse and style. And I think he's got style in abundance, but I think there's a bridge there that isn't quite built because it's it's two minutes of unhinged brilliance. Yeah, and yeah. I, and and the, and it just and it will either end abruptly or some of the ideas are underdeveloped, but uh, on the surface are great. And I just feel like he could dig in a little bit more. He could be a bit more patient. I think. I think. And I think that's just. I'm working it out as I'm saying it. And I think that is the thing that he lacks is patience. And I think that that would lead him to such a better place where these ideas can be stretched out and we could get to enjoy them in their entire entirety instead of an 11 song album that lasts 25 minutes <laughs> and every song is average two minutes 20 do you know what i mean i feel like he's in a place where he could make these epic voyages but we still only get these little slivers into what's actually possible and i think that's his main frustration is that i don't get to express my potential i don't get to utilize my potential and i do think that that's actually a self-imposed limitation that's I mean, I think the word potential in, in itself is a limitation because it's like this destination that is like, I don't know, the end version of yourself. And to me, potential is kind of like, I don't know, it's just a limiting word because it's like reaching your potential just means you're like reaching. Like you have some finite end. place yeah. that you could get to. When I think it's just more about like continually challenging yourself because I know people are like, they always ask, do you think this is your best record? Do you think? And I don't really think of my records as being the best of anything. I kind of just think like, what's the best thing I can make right now that represents my headspace sonically? And that's kind of what you have to accomplish. I don't really think, I think potential is just very limited because what happens after you've reached your potential? Like, where do you go? <laughs> you know? It's interesting because I've always assumed the word potential to be limitless. It's a syn syn synonym of unlimited for me, which is interesting. I don't know, maybe maybe that's something that you've heard over your career so far that maybe you've taken like a... I don't know, it's more like how I've heard people use the word, like, mm. oh, I feel like I'm not reaching my potential or like... I feel like I'm, I haven't hit my like, you know, my mark. And I just like, what mark? I just feel like you just continuously, I just continuously want to be a better version of myself. And like, I don't think there's like a, you know, a ultra Danae that's like killing it in all directions. Because I think after you've reached your ultimate you, if you think about when you're younger and like what you were when you're young and wh where you are now, and if you think about yourself now and like where you want to be in years time, it's very different. Mm. So it's like more like a constant evolution as opposed to like reaching like your, I don't know, boss level. I don't know. <laughs> I hear you. And it's a, it's a very valid point and it's challenging the way I, I use the word, the word potential. But I still do think it implies in itself a level of limitlessness and 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 infinity because i think that potential is just the access to change okay that's what i think it is and people when people are like oh i'm not i'm not reaching my potential it's because they're not growing it's not they're not learning potential is just the possibility of growth the poss oh, okay. okay it's not necessarily like an ideal that has a ceiling it's just the the uh allowing of the self to continue to blossom do you know what I mean? I think that that's... While a plant is still alive, it has potential. But when it's dead, it's it's dead, you know? But yeah, yeah. while it's it's still seeding, it can go through all of the seasons. And I think that that's... Potential is synonymous with life force, to me. It's It actually is a word I use to describe everything pre-life as well. You know, like before we assumed this form, mm -hmm. all we were is potential. And we're and we're here now, maximizing that potential and bringing it into being at every single second, and, and I think it's that continuation, that evolution, like you said, that's how I kind of perceive it. Okay. 
And I've, I find myself doing that recently a lot of the moment, actually, was realizing words that pertain to a certain limited side of language and words that speak to uh, a more infinite perspective. And it's interesting that potential can be seen that way. Well, it's interesting because like, I learned, when I wrote words, maybe it was like a year ago, I learned that the word amateur means a lover of which just kind of like blew my mind because obviously the word amateur like to people means like, you know, you're subpar at a certain level mm. of whatever medium. But it really just means, it just translates as being a lover of, which I think is like really beautiful actually because like a lot of people are so terrified, especially to try something new, to come off amateurish. But in reality, like... I don't know, I think it's really beautiful to try something new and just be an admirer of something and see it like that. But it's amazing. Like, I find it interesting to look up what different words. Etymology is my favourite thing yeah. in the world. And my second favourite thing in the world is figuring out where we went wrong with the etymology. Because I do feel like now a lot of our language is negative facing, like even with yeah, just yeah. that thing you just said with amateur and it's like professional then in in if we oh my god if we're going to switch the uh the if we're going to switch the etymology of all of our words and we're going to look at life through the perspective of amateur as being the thing to idolize right we all want to be a lover of things we all want to be amateurs at life then being a professional is the worst thing you could possibly be because it's what well, i don't do this for love anymore i do this for money i yeah, do this yeah. for survival and, but professional is the thing, I want to turn pro. I want to be a professional, you know? And that's something I spoke about in the last episode with Olivia Rose is how the commerce always poisons the passion. Yeah, I mean, as well as like, I think about this as well with um, music and like musicianship. Where I, where I do you appreciate it? I think that professional tinge is quite limiting to like how you even see whatever specific thing in your own special way like my friend Juno um this girl that I met years ago like played guitar with her thumbs I thought that was so incredible but like in a professional context of playing guitar people would be like she was booked doing for it a wrong. studio <laughs> session and someone was like can you play this guitar part and she was like right <laughs> start getting the thumbs out people would be like what the hell but it's crazy I think like sometimes the proper way to do things limits people from actually just you know, like approaching how they actually see it. And I think that's what's the in, what's turned the industry on its head. People are kind of making music in their own ways beyond like what the kind of typical structure and, you know, like in the whole indie music scene is like, you know, just been like on, been on like a dramatic rise. Like people like Chance the Rapper, like wow. doing it on his own in a sense. Oh. Well, with, <laughs> with all the help of, Apple and yeah, and having a dad who's right hand man to but Barack I Obama. I think it's really, I think it's really cool in a sense, like how music has shifted into a kind of more digital lens and the textures of like, I don't know, sounds that you find in your computer. I think it's kind of cool that like a lot of people, you know, start off making music in like a completely different way, mm. and. I know, it's something that I look for in, when I when I um, when I start like a you know project or something. It's like you're discovering yourself in an instrument in like a different way, in a way that I don't think a lot of people would approach it. And it's like breaking those rules, but like not being afraid to go there with it. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. Like every project I make, I feel like I have to teach myself how to write again because I feel like I've never done it before. Yeah. And it feels completely brand new and it feels really like, I don't know, like magical almost. I think it's amazing when you cross that point of like inspiration where you really hit, you know, hit onto like what you exactly you're feeling and you hit this different part of you that feels like, you're you know on earth in like a brand new version of yourself mm. i think that's what's magical about art like it never stops you know it never changes like well not never changes sorry it's always changing it's always evolving it never changes in the fact that it always changes yeah it's uh 
its variation is is unending. Yeah. And that's I think that's the maddening part about it. And I think that's why so many people don't do it because it's a commitment to a life of uncertainty. But it's weird because, yeah, it's like these um, paradoxes come into it all the time because it's a life of uncertainty, but you can be certain that you'll always be uncertain. It's like, I think that's the thing that makes people feel funny is that you have to find some kind of solid ground in an ever-evolving environment. And that's, I think, is the, is the, the ultimate self. You know what I mean? The, you, when you get to a point of your life where there's no judgment, there's no shame, there's none of that, there's an instant access to your instinct, which takes the shape of the inner child. When you're, that's your solid ground. That's your like anchor. That's the thread that you can always pull on to be like, oh, I'm still good. I'm still good. But until you, until you have some kind of whiff that that solid ground even exists, life can be an absolutely terrifying thing. Yeah, because I don't think people are that self-reflective, mm. unfortunately. I don't think people, I think people sit down by themselves without any distraction. I like literally terrified. <laughs> it's like, okay, I have to fill the void with something. I think that's something that I like think about. How do I actually feel about myself? <laughs> and the honesty of that. And I think that's what songwriting is. It's like sitting down, whether it's on your own or with other people. Like songwriting sessions are crazy because it's like, hey stranger this is how i'm feeling right now and it's like you're just like let's all very take away and have a good cry <laughs> let's just cry right now and like <laughs> everything's on the line you're just you know you're talking to all these people about like whatever it is you're experiencing and there's something really refreshing about that because i feel like in lots of other scenarios people don't do that and people don't do that for themselves so i think that's what's really also a bit surprising like I wrote this song on the record called Cascades and it was like one of the last songs I wrote and I was like really I was in LA and LA is just like a crazy place where you like you do so much like interaction and you're so social but like you can just be completely alone <laughs> it's kind of really weird you know juxtaposition um but I was writing these songs and my manager had just like flown to Atlanta and we were in, sharing an Airbnb. And for like the longest while, it was the first time they had so much alone time and it just terrified me. I was like, shit, God, like I didn't realise that I had all of these emotions or I had these thoughts that I wasn't necessarily addressing. So I think that's what's kind of like really, it's like therapeutic. I think that's why you make something or you write something and you feel like, You've just like lifted a massive weight off of your like shoulders. If someone was listening to this and and heard you say, you know, people don't sit by themselves and self reflect without feeling like there's this void they have to fill. If I was that type of person, I would probably point my finger at you and be like, well, neither can you because you pick up a guitar or a pad and pen. But then to do that, you have to you have to engage with you have to engage with your own thoughts. So I think people genuinely. I don't think most people do that. I think it would be an exercise if you told people to just sit still um, and not do anything and just actually listen to whatever, you, you know, your headspace is. I think people would really struggle. But I think that's what is maybe the healthiest part of being a songwriter is that you constantly evaluate it and how you think. And it's like, how do I feel right now about this? And as well, like, what's really funny about this record, I've written, like, love songs, which I've never done, ever. Like, I've never... I generally can't think of one that I've written on previous records. But even that, that, like, unashamed, like, thing of self-expression, we're like, actually, I think I really want to write about this now. Because this is what I'm experiencing right now. So I think that's really empowering. I think it's really like healthy. I, I find it fascinating that the raw material of crea creation exists in silence. Which is, again, a beautiful definition of art. Being what is art? It's something out of nothing. Which is describing life itself yeah which is absolutely terrifying once again that comes with such a responsibility and i think that's part of um 
part of this podcast that's interesting is having the conversations with with artists who who are artists who almost shy away from the title or at one point in their life have felt a tremendous amount of responsibility because there is like a godlike property to it god in this sense of a creator and it's um a heavy load to bear and i know i've got friends who are artists and struggle with it because they don't want to take the responsibility that comes with it that's crazy to me it's it's crazy to me because i think i had a really weird like sometimes i genuinely think about it i feel like i had a really weird <laughs> upbringing where like my dad was like my manager when i was really young so i was very self-assured as a kid because my dad was a musician and like literally the first song I wrote, I played it to my parents. I was in like year seven. He 11. said, you're a star. <laughs> I was like, okay, so like, well, how do you want to do this? Do you want to do this? You can do it. And just be like, you're like an artist and like him, just the validation from home. And I had this headspace. I was like, yeah, I can do this. And I was like, I don't know, I was really very, I was really serious. My headspace from like really young was just like, I'm going to be an artist when I'm older. I'm like, I'm going to be signed. I'm going to like, I had this really strange clarity that I think was very terrifying because like some of the things I did when I was young was very like cringe worthy. Like when I think about it. Like what? <laughs> oh, it's so embarrassing. So when I was younger, like, because yeah, my dad was my manager and stuff. When I was in like year nine, I remember I did like my first ever photo shoot and my parents convinced me, they said that they thought it'd be a really cool idea if I like printed like poster size images from the photo shoot and like signed them and like gave them to my friends. I mean, that's pretty cool. <laughs> if you brought one in now and gave one to me, I'll be very um, happy. Um, Think about being 14 yeah, I know, I know. and then like doing a photo shoot and like what you thought was like <laughs> fashionable then <laughs> and like making like a literal poster the size of like a fucking... I don't know, half, you know, a wall and then signing it and then giving it to your friends and thinking that was normal. Proper power move. <laughs> but it's weird because when I was younger, I didn't think it was, I didn't think anything of it. I just thought, yeah, of course, they'd want a picture of me. Why not? Like, but now I'm like, shit, there's like, <laughs> all my friends in secondary school have like an actual image of me that I've signed <laughs> that I really hope never see as the light of day because that would be so mad. <laughs> It'd be like really embarrassing. But that's a proper power move. And when I met you, I don't think you were much older. When, I, when did I meet you? How old were you? We both. 18. I think you were like 18. And I was like 19 or 20. Yeah. And you were very shy. And you yeah. didn't seem like the sort of person <laughs> who would be printing off posters. Or you didn't have that uh, self assertiveness or self-certainty because i went i feel like i just experienced so many things really early in my life yeah where i did i literally when i was younger i really wanted to be an actress so i just remembered being like i don't know like seven eight and being like mom i'm gonna be an actress like there's this competition that i want to do like you know we should do it and me doing this monologue i've got this picture of myself like doing this monologue with like a doll that looks really like and wearing these like really cr crazy clothes I have no idea what I wrote the monologue about but I was that kind of child and I had this experience but I had this like crazy breakdown like at like 17 where I just like had this like probably the worst mental health like breakdown I've ever had in my life it was actually really pivotal where for two years I didn't write anything because mentally I was like I told myself I'd never write again and so I just didn't do anything it was really weird and I came out of the other side and I wrote like in uh, sixth form I wrote uh, No Light which is on my first record and I wrote like Gone and stuff like this um, and I just came out of it writing all this kind of stuff it was like I was like born again mm. but I felt like I had I feel like lots of artists have like a really crazy like mental kind of breakdown at some point and I think I had it just so young that that was probably the point I was just like coming out of this headspace. So I think now it's it's interesting that confidence to be like, here's an image of me like where I'm like doing these weird poses and then <laughs> doing I my first record. <laughs> <laughs> and then doing like my first record and having almost the opposite thing where at the time I couldn't necessarily see myself because I was in such a... 
I don't know, like I was like recovering almost from this app, like just mental like breakdown. It was well, really what terrifying. Was the, what was the blockage? I don't know. I think it was just, I don't know. I really don't know why, what really hit me, but I just had this wave of like, I don't know, like deep sadness that was like very, it felt really, I don't know, it was really, it affected me. And I remember it was the first time that I had therapy and stuff and I was in sixth form and I just didn't write. I wasn't writing and I felt really like, I don't know, I just felt really negative about what I was doing or just everything in general. And then something changed for me. Like, it's really weird. I joined like a glee club. And through this glee club, I kind of had this unhinged thing because at the time I would have never done it. I was like, glee club, why would I do that? And no one knows this because I think the Glee Club was also like very intense, actually. Like we had like extreme emotional like moments. It was like a family. We were like this family that was maybe a little bit dysfunctional and we argued a lot. But doing this thing at the time that to me felt really brave to do got me out of that headspace of thinking so much about like the future and the possibility of like what could happen and just actually being very present and just doing something brand new. And it allowed me to escape that darkness that I had. Was that darkness like a personal darkness or was it more existential? I think I was just terrified of like, I don't know, like the future. Mm. <laughs> I was terrified of the future. I think it had a lot to do because at the time when you're in like sixth form and stuff, there's all this like... I don't know, it's almost terrifying the amount of pressure that is put onto you. But I think at that point, because I was so, between year seven and nine, I had all this extreme energy that I had put into like my like future career that I really hit a stumbling block because I like was at an extreme and was like terrified of like, I don't know, the future and like all this other stuff. And I kind of just had... I don't know. I had like, when I did my GCSEs, I had my first like ever anxiety attack. And it's crazy because I think about it now, like I basically woke up in the middle of the night. I didn't understand what was happening because I'd never felt it before. And just started running. I just ran outside <laughs> and like in the middle of the night. And I was literally running away from whatever it was I was feeling. And I just, no one explained it to me before. So I think I was just experiencing a kind of like, I don't know, anxiety in a way that I'd never, I just didn't understand what it was. Um, so it's crazy. I don't know. I think I just had a very extreme, I was very self-assured as a child and I just had this extreme moment where I just, I don't know, I experienced anxiety for the first time and it just like whacked me out completely. I believe it. I feel like my first or well, any time, any time I've had like any anxious moments or moments of real panic is when I've tried to think about death or at least all of my delusions or illusions or whatever you want to call them being enough to like get me to my meeting with death, but they weren't enough to carry me through to the other side. And I think that a lot of my own personal anxiety or, or grief, I prefer mm -hmm. to call it, was tied up in not believing that I was strong enough to take what lays ahead in the next life. What you know, whatever that looks like, even if it's nothing, my ability to handle nothing forever or whatever lays lays ahead. And I think I feel like a lot of the conversations I have, it usually comes down to not necessarily the fear of death itself, but the I'm not strong enough to carry or I'm not strong enough to handle whatever happens the, in the future. Which, yeah. which always, if you trace it back to the very end of that thread, is, well, I don't think I'll be able to... There'll be nothing left of me when I die. I think that's... I know personally that's where some grief came from. But I, it also feels like whenever I speak to somebody, that's where it... That's the essence of it. I'm not strong enough. And then again, that if you strip that back, I'm not good enough. Mm. 
and I'm not strong enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy. They're, they're always like a big cocktail of of that, which is interesting yeah. at the very least. Yeah, I totally get that. I think as well, like, the more and more I read, the more and more I was terrified, <laughs> terrified of what's going on. Like, even, like, when I when I did when I did We Used to Bloom, I was like, when I wrote Bring You Shame, I was like, just becoming more and more aware of like the world and like the truth behind what happens what's happening in the world and it's it just terrified me so much that that I became like I was like really addicted to information in like a really self like detrimental way where it just didn't help my headspace and it's kind of like a weird thing it's like how do you protect your like you know peace of mind <laughs> And also, you know, be in, you know, on, I don't know, be in the know of like what's happening. How do you control? How do you remain innocent and informed? And yeah. Because <laughs> it's, we lose our innocence on the realization that we're going to die at some point. Yeah. And it's how do you reconcile the two? Yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. Like when I, when I wrote Bring You Shame, I was like, terrified of like you know humanity I was terrified of myself as well as like being a human and like like I felt shame I felt really I don't know I felt really upset about a lot of things and I couldn't reconcile with that part of my brain and I had to write these songs and with this new record it's interesting because I've written a lot of songs that are like very self-confessional and very kind of very honest and I think a lot of it is like I wrote a couple of songs about just allow myself to fall short and reconciling with the part of myself that's very human and you know falling short of my own expectations sometimes and taking myself like out of scenarios that I don't necessarily need to be in if they're like gonna affect me mentally and really reconciling with with the part of myself that wants to perform, like perform like just my relationship with happiness and just like understanding that it's not black and white. It's not like a thing that's like you're happy or you're you're sad. Yeah. It's not like this thing. Like so it's interesting how I'm like I don't know, I'm coming to terms with more like just just the human part of me and allow myself to feel whatever it is I need to feel whether it's like extreme like anxiety where it's like extreme moments of isolation where I just like literally stop talking to everyone <laughs> on the planet and I'm like I feel like this thing but I think it's important you know to feel whatever it is and not like not freak out too much which is obviously hard in the moment but freak out enough to challenge yourself yeah but not enough to lose yourself yeah, and it's finding that uh, optimal space of comfortability and challenge. That's like the the intersection of those is growth. Yeah, but also like confronting trauma. Yeah, it's like so real. Like whether it is like realizing that you need to be in therapy, or I love a solo trip. I love going away somewhere and actually not running away from myself in a sense of like doing all the conventional things like going out and which is valid enough as well if that's kind of what you need to do but I remember I went to Japan on my own and well I, I went with some friends and then I stayed longer on my own and it was just like so good to like actually just be on my own and just like reconcile with the part of my brain and then like refresh I feel like people don't do that enough and that's why people kind of dramatically like on the weekends like go crazy on a kind of nine to five thing and if like feel so exhausted from like pretending <laughs> like, for every day you know that they like throw themselves into like doing whatever it is they need to cope I think that's a shame and that's what I like about the kind of songwriting world and that confessional thing you know what like I'm feeling this right now. Can we write about this shit thing that someone said to me? Or like, 
and th- that is what I think is like amazing about um, songwriting. It's the opportunity to say exactly how you feel. And I think that's what people appreciate. Like, I love, I love hearing that in other people and like what they what they write about and how you know how they approach their own art I think is really like um I think it's really human I kind of crave like it's really weird I, I kind of reel on that like I remember years in like maybe like four five maybe probably five years ago I went to Paris on my own peak breakdown <laughs> and it was really terrifying but it was really important to like actually have the opportunity to be able to reconcile with myself and you know I think it's not something to escape from it's actually amazing to to allow yourself to um, be open and be honest about what you're actually feeling and challenge the things about yourself that you don't really like especially habits habits that you have that are like probably you know not very good and looking at them in like a I don't know as like in a hmm, looking at it from an honest point of view and I think a lot of people experience things and trauma and don't necessarily address it and just kind of like you know continue to do whatever it is um but I think it's amazing to reconcile that because obviously I don't have you know it will figure it out for sure but there's something really there's something really amazing about being okay with that about that uncertainty and being okay with the fact that you know there's probably gonna be another time where I just like you know mentally lose it but it's okay to allow yourself to stray away from like you know other people's surroundings and just focus on yourself in those dark places which many people find difficult to go what do you find i mean i just find like for me with writing and going there i think what i find is just like just how i actually really feel and i can unpack i can unpack the things and why why i do the you know result to the whatever vice it is like um why I react in certain ways and actually look at them deeply in myself and be like okay you're doing this because of x y and z and you're you always like end up in this scenario because of whatever happened to you or whatever was said to you at whatever specific time has actually deeply psychologically affected you so that's been something that I think I think is important to do to always keep in check like how you actually feel about yourself Um, because I think a lot of people deep down like are terrified to cross that barrier which is it is terrifying it is a simply terrifying thing to do and to be completely honest with the people around you how you feel and there's just this pressure to have it all together and to be like you know very you know, yeah, yeah, I'm working on this and, you know, it's going amazingly and blah, 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 blah. And maybe it is going amazingly, but at the same time, like, there's a pressure for everything to be, you know, amazing. And I'd love to be in a place where I can go to, like, whatever social scenario and actually have an honest response from people. And I really appreciate when people are honest. I'm like, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that with me. And then you can feel like, you know, you can relax almost. Because it's interesting, there's, I know a lot of people have like a FOMO kind of complex, but even FOMO in itself is like, is cra- is a crazy thing to experience because it's like, I don't really feel like I miss out on stuff anymore, to be honest, because I always feel like I'm where I'm meant to be. <laughs> yeah. So. I always feel like the party's wherever I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's but it's crazy. It's crazy because I think, but I think that's what's changing. I think a lot of people are so much more like open about what they talk about, and I think social media has kind of done that. I think you're able to see even people that you idealize in a very extreme kind of close proximity, which I don't know if necessarily is the greatest thing in the world, 
But I think it kind of normalizes like experiences and it allows people to talk more and be honest more about exactly what they're feeling. Mm. Even in families as well. Like I feel like a lot of people have are like a <laughs> are like a certain version of themselves, including me, with their family. Mm. Where it's like this is the part of yourself that you want your parents to know about and there's like an other part of yourself that it's like you know you're and it's like that with work as well a lot of people go to work and are like a percentage of themselves and then they go here and they're like this percentage of themselves because that's the like presentable version of themselves that's the professional version of themselves and it's like I'd love I'd love if my like member of family was like you know this is like going really badly or like, mm. you know, you know, our parents who probably have this pressure to seem like extremely responsible and not have the scope for ha making mistakes. And it's, I mean, and that's, that's, that's a massive bridge to cross as well. Like seeing your parents in this lens of just like a human. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I remember that was like a p kind of a turning point for me. But the thing is, I've never, because I had a uh, turbulent childhood, let's say, I never really looked at my mum like a mum. First of all, she was just way too young to even be a mum. So it's, you don't have that association when your mum's like 18 years old. So you're not much older than I am, even though I'm a little kid. Like You're not much older than me. So I can look at you and realise that that help that I'm looking for isn't isn't coming. So I've never really, and then I think that, with my relationship with my mum kind of made that a bit uh, detached because mm. I never really know, knew how to look at her because it was like, well, I don't know how to look at you as a human because I don't really know who I am yet. And I can't look at you as a mum because I know that the illusion that that role even exists it was shattered way too early for me. You know, it's like I realised that no one can save me or help me quite young. Um, and then it wasn't until I was about 21, 22, where I was like, oh, you're, I'm almost like your big brother now. That's like, And you're almost like my little sister now, which is like a really interesting thing to happen. But for the first time in my life, I could actually place my relationship with my mum. I could actually be like, oh, this is actually what it's like. I have something to refer it to. And I feel I feel like a big part of my own uh, lostness was in relation to that. Hmm. I think not being able to place my familial relationships, it gave me like a more of a concrete ground to stand on. And it is a, it's a life-changing moment when you actually see the fallibility of a parent. of what, Because then it's like, I do feel like from children we live in this, especially now, humans are, for the longest period of time, are um, dependent on their parents. I think the second one's like an elephant or something like that. But I feel like it's only a couple of years in the animal kingdom. With us, it, it can stretch up to like 30 years, even a lifetime. Yeah. But because of the size of our brains, we have to be dependent on adults for at least the first 11 to 12 years. And that's detrimental in a sense that we put off the realization of the importance of accepting that you are alone or, or accepting your own solitude, yeah. which we've identified as such an important part of growth that gets put off because we're so dependent on this hero figure of the parent. And in mythology, you learn that actually the first thing you, you have to do is kill your parents is to let them go uh, Camille Paglia quote if um, freedom is predicated on the abandonment of dependency hmm. Which is when I heard that I was like oh so obvious of course but wow so true if you want to be free you have to let go of the dependence on anybody else for your survival for your approval for your validation and all of those things it's just something that takes people too long to realise some people uh, sadly might have to wait until a parent dies to let that part of it go. Some people, if they're lucky or if they do the hard work, get to get there in a good amount of time and then enjoy 
a true, sincere relationship with their parents. Mm. But it's difficult, difficult to uh, navigate. It's like uh, that's the first step, right, of stepping out into the unknown. Can I exist without dependency? Can I exist without somebody looking after me? I mean, dependency is really interesting, especially if you think about love and like being in love and this feeling of like, I don't know, this feeling of codependency in a sense with someone that you can initially live without, but you feel like you can't live without them. It's mm. kind of like this interesting thing that you cross. But I think like what I think is really interesting and what I've taken from love and my relationship with like by love life and stuff is like I used to be so shut off from the concept of like, I don't know, that idea of codependency or being with someone that you want to feel vulnerable in front of and you want to allow to be in your space and that's, you know, to experience you as like a whole person. Um, and I feel like, that, I feel like that's what's been so crazy because I've never written, like, like, like I said in this record, I've never written about this part of my life before, but it felt like really, it felt like an amazing release to actually to do that. I believe it. I've, I've I mean, there. love songs are hard though, because it's like, how do you? It's the same thing with like a happy song. Mm. Like it's like, how do you make one without sounding like a Sesame Street character on on crack or something? <laughs> <laughs> how do you make these things that are perceived to be transient and seasonal universal? Like happiness, the reason why a happy, a happy song is so hard to pin down is because the feeling itself is seasonal. It's like a, it's like weather it comes, it goes. You're happy today, tomorrow clouds and rain, and that's, Oops. and that and that's the way it's supposed to be. But that's why they're so hard to grasp onto because they're like all things honest and true, ever changing, and ever morphing. I feel like. A lot of the stuff that I read is about love, and it's all about love anyway. Really, at the end of the day, if we're gonna, if we're gonna, if we're gonna, you take the definition of art to be a relic or proof that you can step out into the unknown and there still be something on the other side. That's like a affirmation, and affirmation is based in love. So it's all love anyway. Regardless of whether it's about a relationship or not, yeah, that's true. But I get, I get you when it's more like a uh, physical thing, like it's a, about a real relationship as opposed to your relationship with the infinite or you know whatever one of these esoteric topics. When it's a more human thing, it's way harder to do. I mean, what do you write about mostly? What do you? What's like? I write about. Crazy? I remember what I was going to say. I mostly, and I think this is a masculine thing. I think this is a man thing because I think it's something that, I think it's something that men are faced with more totally than women are. Mm -hmm. But I mostly write about my relationship with death and whatever that is, whatever eternity is, whatever whatever that means, whatever that looks like, I think. And everything's in reference to that. Like even my love songs in her hands, I'm in the palm of your hands. Like I want to swing from your fingers and build my home. It's not necessarily about a person. It's about the beyond. Yeah. yeah. It's like I want to find a safe space in forever that I can cling to and be okay. And that's like a loving way of approaching it. And even like I have another song called Together. I think I ended up calling it at the last minute. And that's more about sex itself, but it's still about becoming one in this union, which is essentially life and death meet. Like that, that's what it always comes back to for me. And I do think that that's a, 
a man thing. I think that's a ma- thing that men have to be faced with because they're kind of the more material of the sexes. Mm-hmm. The way I frame this in my mind is that women, if you were to get pregnant and have a daughter, that's a physical representation of immortality. Yeah. It's, that's the... That's Oros Boros. That's the the snake that swallows its own tail. It just goes on forever and ever and ever. And that's living proof of infinity. Whereas men is like a open circuit. Do you know what I mean? There's finitude in masculinity. There's finitude in 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 man. And and I think that leads to quite a lot of that leads to toxic masculinity or whatever. Naturally so. Um, but yeah. But what I was going to say previously, before, unless you have anything to... No, what were you going to uh, say? What I was going to say before is that in one of my crazy dark times, I was convinced that I was Jesus. <laughs> it, it, it got really, really wild at, at some point. And I was like, it was almost like stigmata. I didn't have fucking wake up one morning, I've got holes in my hands. Um, but I was convinced that I was actually like an incarnation of Jesus. It was like proper delusion. But then I had a conversation with someone who's like, well, what, what what do you expect? Jesus is just an ideal. It's just a character of like the best possible version of yourself that you can be. And when you're channeling truth or when you're trying to be sincere and honest and love man regardless of its flaws, mm-hmm. who do you expect to feel like? Yeah. And I was like, oh, thank fuck for that. Thank God I had that conversation. <laughs> um, but then I started to like really analyze the literature like really start to think about the bible and all of this stuff and really start to think about this idea of god and then it brought me back full circle to all relationships to all to all dualities in life which is that everything is mutually dependent this uh, this western idea of god is that we are in service of the Most High. As Kanye would say, my life is not my own. I give it all up to God. And I have the image in my head of God listening and being like, well, just do what you want to do, you know? Just be, just, you don't, that's not what it's all about. My life force flows through you to go in any direction it feels like. Don't bring it back. Go that way. Face the world. Be in the world. Be of the world. And because life is predicated on death, there's a mutual dependency there. Life is dependent on death for its existence, but death is dependent on its existence. Death is dependent on life for its existence. And in these relationships, it's like with with me and Helena, I'm in this relationship, but I'm dependent on you to hold up your end of the deal. You have to be the best version of yourself that you can possibly be. And she's dependent on me to do the exact same thing and to show up in times of need, but also to show up for myself in times of need. It's it's a beautiful thing, actually. And that's the... Exactly. But that's all of life. Your interpersonal relationships are no different to the preconditions of existence. So what we have to die? So what we have to break up? So what nothing is forever? Even though it is forever because it's all mutually dependent. That's the whole point of it. It's this revolving door of dependency and mutual appreciation. And for me, it was like, ah, I'm free. I'm not, as a man, I'm not in service to anything. I, I used to feel like I was born into prison chains. I used to feel like I was born in in on a prison yard, like doomed to die. I had nothing to offer but my protection, mm-hmm. because that's how men are, are, are. That's how a man could perceive his existence, and that's like that makes you angry because it's like some sick game. And when I really confronted that, when I said that out loud, I mean, I was on, I think I was on mushrooms, <laughs> <laughs> but I said that out loud, and I was like, "Fuck you." fuck whatever brought me here just to just to be that i could be so much more and then i was felt like i was hit by lightning because i'd got it so wrong and my brain was just like i was punished for it essentially and shown the right way to perceive it no i think i think it's really beautiful because i think a lot of a lot of people are kind of like i i really believe in the kind of universe and like manifestation and trust in in trusting in the universe and like 
I don't know, fate and time and timing. And I think the understanding of like dependency is like kind of terrifying to a lot of people, but it's just being vulnerable to to how you really feel and like what's in front of you and just going through it that the constructs of like overthinking it too much I think for me like being free is like being free from fear and all these other things that interrupt like your headspace but it's interesting you talk about love and um because like have you read this book called uh, I think it's called all about love by bell hooks all about love but it's insane. Like she breaks down her relationship with love in general and how she was introduced to it based on family, her own relationships and with herself. And it was just like crazy how she broke down how we're like introduced to love in this sense of like, I don't know, love isn't complicated. And it is like this infinite thing that you talk about, but it's crazy how people can complicate it so much. And she talks about like, um, I don't know, how men are taught to love and how society frames us to kind of almost fail at relationships in a sense, based on our own relationships with how we love ourselves, how we think about ourselves without someone else. And that dependency or the feeling like, you know, you'd be more of a whole person with like your life would be complete with when you're with someone else when in reality you you know you're already like a complete person but it's interesting how she like unpacks like so many of her fears in this book um but it's something that I completely had to let go of to like to love myself in a sense in like the kind of unconditional sense of like um sometimes I feel like a burden to myself in a way like you can really explain that as in like sometimes I really terrorize my mind with like questions that are like almost impossible to resolve mm. and I think a lot of people are at that you know get to that point where they like ask themselves like will you know will this like be like this will this go on forever will whatever you're feeling and just kind of like making peace with that part of your brain and just allowing things to be bad or good and I don't know just seeing just allowing yourself to like experience how things will naturally flow you know that resolve if that makes sense mm -hmm. I've just remembered something that I've always wanted to talk to you about <laughs> <laughs> we we found ourselves in a position once when we were hanging out of Caught in the miracle, caught in the awareness of the miracle of life, or just how mental it is. And I was extremely depressed at the time. And you proclaimed, like, how magnificent it is. And I was like, yeah, where does it end? And then you said, where does it begin? And that actually changed my life. And this is something that... What? Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is something I've never told you before. That just you saying, where does it begin, flipped my whole world upside down. Because I'd never... I never looked at it that way. I was always looking to the end, to the decay, to all of that stuff, and never once trying to figure out from which it bloomed. Like, to use your album as a um, point of reference. I, I've, I mean, I've never told you that, but that was, like, life-changing for me. And I don't, know, I don't know where that even came from in yourself, but it was, like, made me realise I was looking at it all wrong. Which is great. Yeah, I think... Yeah, I think it's interesting how we are almost taught to con continuously fear the end. Or fear the end of whatever, you know, of our lives. And we're made to feel like you work away in this kind of like... Almost like a, I don't know, machinery, like kind of mm. industrial kind of sense where you're like working away until you like, I don't know... Um, till you can't work anymore and it's like this thing that's like terrifying and awful but I don't know I think I think that's a shame you know because I think the way I see the way I resolve that kind of issue of like how will this end like what if I 
I'm old and I grow, you know, die alone, all this kind of like <laughs> things that you that used to terrify me. And I just think it's just beautiful to be able to have the opportunity to like, I don't know, to do something brand new. And I think that's what's amazing to, for me is understanding. I don't know what I'm going to do in 30 years time, but I'm sure I'll find something that will make me excited in a new way. I think that's what's like really amazing. Like the kind of new breeds of life that you start. Like I could, I don't know, I might open a shop that like sells, I don't know, tea made from seaweed or something. <laughs> Have you been to Haeckel's in Margate? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. But, you know, you don't know. You just don't know what path it's going to be. But so many people just see growing old as like a awful thing that you do. And like, you know, your 20s are like meant to be your kind of chapter of like, I don't know, exploration. But I feel like the exploration doesn't end in mm. a sense. Like you just constantly, there's something new. I think that's what's amazing, like, about being alive. I don't, I don't know. That's what excite. That's what's exciting for me. Being able to accurately label your emotions is like such a powerful thing in life. Because even someone's fear, like you just said, of being able to go, will I remain curious until the end? Because a life without curiosity is like a life you you might you're as good as dead anyway. Yeah. Um, and it's those questions, it's not necessarily even about death itself. It's like, can I maintain this level of enthusiasm? Can I maintain this connectedness? Can I maintain this intrigue and curiosity? Can I remain a child even in my own old age? That's a difficult question to ask in theory and a, a much easier answer to discover in action. I think we're like beaten out of it. We're beaten out of that curiosity through like, I don't know, the school system of like, these are the correct answers, yes or no. I think learning is made to feel like, you know, like an awful task. Like mm. you just, you know. So it was revolutionary for me, especially with reading. Reading was a thing that I like discovered realistically for pleasure only in the last like know, five, six years or so. Same, yeah, same. Because before... I thought of it as something that I was forced to do. You're given a book and you're made to read it, even if you don't like it. Mm. And then the thought of like me being able to pick up a book and really feel like blown away or like feel like someone's actually directly talking to me and introducing me to something new or I don't know, just opening my mind to like a different point of view on something really simple. And I think that's what's that's what I kind of had to come in come back to is just the concept of learning is like you know it's magical and it's crazy that we're beaten out of that curiosity and people don't continue to you know push that level of curiosity like in themselves people don't ask questions people don't like talk mm. as much because a lot of people feel like they when they ask questions like they're intruding on someone's or like, worried that they might look stupid yeah or like the the worst thing ever is when you like when people just pretend like they knew it mm. you know like even the concepts of learning from someone else can feel quite like hierarchical yeah like like you're being I don't know like it's patronising or something like oh and I already knew that when in reality you just didn't really know it yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like pretending so I love the honesty of like oh no I actually I've never heard of this album oh I've never heard of that film or like I didn't even know about whatever it was like so what what how do you remain artistically challenged and artistically curious what feeds that hunger I think I've always been I think everyone's curious but I think just reading about the things I like or like understand I love reading essays like kind of more non-fiction style books but um I think reading more has engaged that curiosity more for me um I think as well, just doing something else beyond music, to be honest, because music in itself, like, or just, I, I think everyone kind of gets stuck in this headspace that they have to do one thing and they can't just do, they can't do other things in a very, like, whatever way. So, I don't know, it could be, I could pick up gardening as like a... I believe it. As like a, you know, thing that I could probably, probably will do in the future. And... 
you know, I'm learning something that I don't necessarily have to take on as a career. So just that's that's the thing as well, like learning things that you don't have to take on as a career path and just as the capability of doing something is like very healthy mm. for for us. And to, to happily be an amateur. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you are also a chef. Yeah. Uh, creator of D's Table <laughs> and very soon a restaurant. Yeah, it's kind you, of crazy. Like you said in January, it's Brixton. In January in Brixton. Um, but that's another like that's that was such a crazy thing to come into because like when I started, it, I had no idea what I was doing. No one told me how to run or to even start or how to approach it. But I kind of always knew that love was in me, so I was like, I'm just gonna go for it. And it kind of translated to so many people that it was kind of like. I don't know, it made me feel like what I was doing was like really important, not just for my own interpreta- interpretation of food, but just because there's like food, like just like with music or it's like a kind of nostalgic kind of thing. This It's something that I think connects us all culturally. You know, everyone has grown up with, you know, food being a part of their lives. So I think it's amazing to touch base on like, this nostalgic part of people's lives and make food that can hit and take you back to like when you were younger when you first had I know chocolate milk or something do you find taste to be more objective or subjective than sound yeah I think it's more um I think it's more uh subjective because everyone's taste is completely different like I can make something everyone can make for instance Everyone can make like guacamole and not be given a recipe or even be given a recipe and it will probably all taste different, right? Mm. Because someone might put more lime, someone might put more chili, someone might put more coriander, salt or pepper and they all have like a kind of different vibe to it because I think, you know, like we all, we all, our taste buds are all kind of one in savouring something kind of slightly different. And I love that and I kind of trust, I lean into that and I trust it. And it's the same thing, I guess, the kind of unknown thing because a lot of the food, a lot of the ideas I have are like, I feel like a bit of a manic person, like it's in my head and I'm like trying my best via taste to try and accomplish whatever it is. I feel like it tasted, it will taste like, if that makes sense. Mm. So like, I don't know, like... um. I'm trying to think of a specific thing. Um, I don't know, like making like an ice cream or something. And I would have this specific idea in my head about, um, I don't know, say if I made like, I don't know, like rum and raisin ice cream or something. And like, I feel like I can taste it without even having it. I'm salivating right now. Yeah. Just thinking so you, about it. So it's like it's you're chasing something that doesn't exist almost mm. because there's no benchmark for it. So a lot of the ideas I have, like I feel a little bit crazy. But it's like you're constantly searching for something new to like chase after. And then when I've made it, then I kind of want to do something else. Do you feel are you finding patterns in it in the language of taste? that is similar to music? Yeah, because there's no right or wrong answer because no record I've made is the same, but in the end, it's still come to a result of a song, you know? So I think it's the same thing with food. Like, I'm like, I'm very much a person that I'm very unscripted. Like, I go in and I'm trying to search for something. I'm trying to do something in a new way. And I think with food, I'm very interested in what, I haven't done before what I haven't seen before and validating that in myself and like trying to search for it so I think it's really cool like it's it's it is almost like a magic trick basically like just like with songwriting because it's like you're pulling on when you're writing a song it doesn't exist but you have the idea and you kind of understand sonically what you want to try and do so it's like a similar thing the reason I asked about the subjectivity of taste is that because there's an objectivity to food where it's like it's not necessarily related to spirit and truth 
and honesty like art is. It's much more related to science and alchemy. If something tastes like shit, it tastes like shit. Do you know what I mean? And no, and I don't know if there's a way around that because if it tastes bad, it tastes bad to everybody, I think. Not necessarily in like, I don't like mushrooms and I understand that somebody else would love mushrooms, but I think an objectively bad dish is just disgusting. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's what you mean. Like there's a science to it. As opposed with music, you know, you can have some really avant-garde stuff that people, that sounds like farts to one person and sounds like entering heaven to other people. But I feel like there is a level of objectivity that comes with the scientific nature of sound. Um, the, uh, taste. Yeah. Like think... alchemy, for example. If you were to invent a new taste, yeah, you would get it wrong so many times because it would be like, oh, that doesn't taste right. I don't know. Maybe I'm completely wrong. I haven't done it. I haven't experimented with, with taste that often. I think it's a mix. I think it's a middle ground because there's some food that I've had that people have like raved about and yeah. like it wasn't really good to me and there's some food that i've like had and instantly felt like wow i've never had anything like this before mm. and felt really almost moved by it and some people didn't necessarily appreciate so it's very subjective i think um you know one of my favorite restaurants could be someone else's like for instance recently there's this vegan pizza place called Pirizza. And it's, I think it's one of the best in London. But I just, I met um, someone I know, a friend of mine, hates it. Thought it was like the worst pizza. There's no such thing as bad pizza. I mean, not not necessarily, even bad pizza is still, still pizza. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, it's interesting that. And I think a lot of it is nostalgia as well. Like, mm. and sometimes when something you you were really nostalgic about isn't as good as you remember, it just completely shatters your world because... That is what, like, is also, like, crushing to me as well. Like, I have so many memories of Jamaica and some dishes that I would ha I've had when I was younger that was, like, the best thing I've had then. And, like, I'm almost nervous to have it because what if I don't think about it in the same way? Mm. I think food holds, like, a deep memory, like, within you when you have, I don't know, your wherever it is, like... I don't know, especially from your mum, like, you know, eating at home and having something, like, kind of stick with you. Like, I think food is, like, this, just such a magical thing that you can encapture that in other people. I think it's really cool that I can get to do that, I hope. I was living in uh, Antwerp at one point. There was this really cool, it was a cafe called Het Boss. And it was like um, Syrian refugees would come every Sunday and cook like amazing Syrian food and all of the money would go back to uh, refugee camps. And then I remember one day the place, the venue opened up this like exhibition space and it was all to do with the al with alchemy and they were experimenting trying to invent new tastes. And I remember thinking that is the coolest thing ever. And they were like, taste this. So like, what is it? I don't know. It just tastes like something. And it was this like, um, it's not like music where there's 12 notes. Music is infinite in its possibilities of those arrangements, but it's very finite in the vocabulary. Whereas with taste, I feel like it's so, there's so many more possibilities. Like, I don't know, acidic, sugary, salty, starchy. I don't, I don't know. But the just the tastes was like, what what is going on? It was a real it's a real alchemy, which I think you probably enjoy quite a lot. It's it's sick because like I don't even seen Chef's Table. Yeah, well, um, the first there's, season. There's one. There's like this really famous restaurant in Spain called El Bui, and it's like basically famous for being the first restaurant to do. What did they do for the first? They, did, they, made, they were the first ones to make like a foam, like to do all these different things that were just like. You know, they pioneered a lot of shit that a lot of restaurants do now. So I think that to me is like exciting, like to like, I feel like a dream of things that don't necessar necessarily exist yet. And I'm more interested in chasing after those kind of visions, almost visions of a dish or vision of like how I think food 
should be or what excites me about food the most. And a lot of the times that could also be very simplistic. It could just be a simplistic, like, sim- very simple idea as well. And I think that's exciting. I love I love food that is, like, just, um, I don't know, just trying to be itself. Like, I think food sometimes, like, especially in this world of, like, um, I don't know, trends and, like, let's make a unicorn coloured, <laughs> you know, bagel waffle whatever it's very easy to just like music to try and do something that is a crowd pleaser and that everyone's gonna do as opposed to like being like what is ex- what do I want to try and capture you know is there a memory that I specifically have of like that I want to make like a tangible experience for someone like I think that's what I that's what I crave that's what I really want to to do I remember after I watched the first episode of Chef's Table, I was like, wow, this really is an art form. Yeah, it's crazy the, how chefs got to where they they are. And I think that that show shows so many different like chefs and their story through food. And like gastronomy, but also like, um, I don't know, just really even simple food and how you can taste like the heart of someone like there's this incredible story about this like Mexican woman I didn't even see it but she like she basically she was in like an abusive relationship and fled Mexico and ran across the border like on her own and like didn't had no idea what she was going to do and then like was like washing up you know dishes in like restaurants stuff she could kind of do and kind of be paid in cash because she didn't have like a green card so and then kind of ended up you know um having to like support her daughter that still lives in Mexico by doing what she was doing and then ended up like opening her own place in her house like just outside of her house and just dared to like open up a spot and then eventually more and more people kept coming and you know she had one of the best restaurants in America Oh, wow. But it's crazy. She ran past the border on her own, you know, escapes like this awful relationship that she was in. And it's just amazing, these stories. It's like so, it's so amazing to hear to hear it because especially from like different um, cultures as well, outside of like, I don't know, chefs that just go to school, like the kind of traditional Cordon story. Blue type guys, yeah. yeah. So I think that's what, it's amazing I get to do something that, I don't know, I can share with other people, create memories with other people. I think that's really special. There's an interesting uh, point of conversation on it as well about mutual dependency again. It's more of an idea of like one flavour on its own in isolation. It's just like, it's just a flavour. But the art of food is the combination between or the collision between different tastes and similarly with music like one note on its own or I mean or is it one note on its own isn't necessarily music or one component on its own isn't necessarily music it's the it's the symphony yeah the symphony the symphony of taste I remember I went to Dishoom the other day and had a the 24 hour lentils the, the lentils that are cooked for 24 hours slow cooked it was the first time I've ever had anything that's slow cooked and I was like I can taste the depth of the flavour was insane I felt like I could taste the history I just did this series about rice and it talks about rice and peas but um, they interviewed the owner and like founder of Dishoom and it's crazy because he basically spent all of his life trying to get validation from his dad about being a chef. And because he wasn't like, basically, they're so traditional and, and stuff, but they kind of um, kind of idolised the concept of like being like a doctor or like all these different jobs that they never, his dad never went to the room. Really? And like he, pa- well, he just didn't, he was like, oh, chef, what does that mean? Like he doesn't understand it, but... He died without ever going to his son's restaurant, which is like one of the, 
you know, most acclaimed restaurants in London, I'd say. Mm. Like, there's like, what, three... It's a staple. People, whenever they come here, they're always like, I've, got, I've heard I've got to try the shoom. It's, but that's crazy to me, like, the concept of, like, um, I don't know, like, being a chef, not being something that is in the same, like, acclaim as, like, being, like, a doctor or... Yeah, right. People have got to eat just as much as they've got to be medicated. I really want to slow cook stuff now. That was like, uh, ever since I had that, I was like, I really want to get a slow cooker. I mean, ve like, all vegetables taste a lot better roasted or like char grilled or like slow cooked i feel like people really look past them in general and don't really actually allow them to like um i don't know take on the flavor that they can but slow cooking is like a yeah wonderful thing i i, I made an onion soup once and slow cooked that for about two or three hours oh, the richness yeah honestly it is a revelation like you re you reveal just how thin certain well in me it revealed just how thin everything I'd ever tasted was. There wasn't this like weight behind it. It's, it's almost like a historical context that you can taste. So like I don't know whether it's because you know they've been cooked for twenty four hours, but the taste is so deep and so rich. It's something I never appreciated before. Well, it's like time, you know. Time in itself is like an ingredient, like it. Um, how long it takes to, to cook things, the patience. Like sourdough versus like, you know, just like regular bread. Like the the culture of the yeast that you, like of the, they use to, um, in the dough itself is patience. It's like an element of patience. It's just time that makes that flavour. So I think it's, like, it's amazing actually that um, we can like, it's almost like, I don't know. It's almost like really poetic. Like it just gets deeper and deeper, like the longer it sits. Mm. And if that was embedded into our culture, <laughs> it would make life so much more, so much easier to navigate if the things would get better with time. The longer something stews for, the longer something lives for, the better the experience of that thing gets, which speaks to everything that we've spoken about in the last two or so hours however long this has been it's uh we could all learn a big lesson from cookery <laughs> which you've tapped into way quicker than the rest of us have because you're doing it it's good i love it i love it because i'm i can be quite fidgety i'm like quite a fidgety person so it you know to be a master of like or to be like a i don't know um have this frame of time like I need to wait two hours for this or even just cutting up things it's labor but it's good for me for someone that's like very like and kind of need to do something to slow down my brain and just like actually going like this meditative like state of mind and you know I think it's really therapeutic for me uh that's kind of led me to another definition of art which is art is the mastery of time. And how does one master time? By defying it. Patience. By going, no time, you're not important. Pass as much as you want. Go as far as you like. I'm not moving. I'm not taking these lentils off the, off the hob. I'm not uh, rushing. I'm not leaving the now, mm. essentially. And it... That's definitely what cinema is about because otherwise you just take a photo. You know? Yeah, it's amazing how time in a scene, it's something that I like discussed recently with my friend, but how the length of a scene can evoke a completely different emotion. Like, I think of a shot. Of a shot, that's what I meant, yeah. Oh. So like someone being in a bathtub, like just a kind of shot of them in a bathtub, just sitting in silence for, you know, five seconds feel different than like 20 seconds. Because you then you kind of like analyze their face more and you like analyze what is in the room. And then you're like, why are they in the bathtub for this long? It's amazing how that extra, you know, 15 seconds kind of allows you to like feel something different mm. or how you can like shift things emotionally. That's something that I've started to incorporate into my music is silence. 
the importance of silence, the importance of space, being able to just let something, even if it's just something as aesthetically pleasing as a reverb or a delay, just ring out, just to fill the space and leave the space empty before I fill it with sound again. And it was something I uh, was um, validated in that documentary I was speaking to you earlier about mm. making waves, the power of sound in cinema. Hitchcock was the first person who made horror slash thriller. Oh yeah, they all, psycho. Yeah, they all relied on music for terror. What he did was took the music away and left you just hearing the... <gasps> like just the, yeah, yeah. The, the sounds of fear, the sounds of terror, and that absence of drama to be replaced with the horror of reality, which is absolutely mind-blowing and such a powerful tool if you're a filmmaker to be like, well... I want to make this scene more frightening. How do I do that? I take away elements. I subtract. Um, and again, with Monos, what I watched recently, really revealed to me the importance of, not the importance, the things you can do by not showing something. A, a, um, a girl was covered in blood and she was stood next to a, they're on a mountain, but there was this part where rainwater was falling out and it looked like a shower and she was washing the blood off of her face and she was having a breakdown and I, you didn't see why. But not seeing why allowed me to run wild with my imagination and think of all of the things that could have happened in the time between I last the last shot and this shot. Mm. So that's the... It's a John, it's John Cage's whole uh, spiel in music, I guess, of the importance of silence in definition the importance of the space around something is just as important as the thing inside the space mm. i find what what i did um on some of the songs in the new record is um when i felt like things were changing i just slowed whatever section of the song down a few like just like i slowed it down in tempo a little bit so it, in transition between sections you would yeah, for one of the songs, the middle eight is like 2 BPM, like slower. Okay. So like, because like the first half of the song, like verse, chorus, verse, chorus is very like, I mean, the song itself has, um, is quite um, emotional, I guess, in terms of lyrics. But then the most vulnerable part of it is the middle eight. So to really feel it, I kind of just took it down to BPM just for that section that's amazing because from a mix perspective what what whoever's mixing your project would do would be to get to the middle eight and either boost it by two decibels or reduce it by two decibels so we lean in closer and really hear what you're saying but you've gone actually what would happen if i didn't just change the volume and change that dynamic what would happen if i just actually slowed it down which is that's such a fucking simple but great idea and did it have the effect that you wanted yeah it, to? it does because it feel like you feel that emotion. It almost feels like a come down, maybe. Yeah. Like that part of the song feels like, um, I think you feel that the two BPM like it's slower. And also the beat isn't there as well in that moment. So you feel the, temp the loss of the tempo as well. Mm. But it's something that I do, I have done a bit more on this record. I think for like one of the songs, like the chorus was like faster, maybe as well. Like we made it slightly, <laughs> slightly faster in like the last chorus or something as well um and reverb is really interesting because i've become less and less of a fan of reverb really but um i find that for the newer some of the songs when it has been in it it's been kind of used as more of like a tactical kind of like effect if that yeah. makes sense so like if i wanted to pick out a specific lyric or i'd put some delay or like to fill the space and then cut it so i, I think there's a lot of like or even, for instance, if there was a really important line in my vocal, I would kind of strip away everything and take the reverb off my vocal for that one moment. So it felt kind of more personal, like yeah. you were having, like it was very important. So it stuck out a bit more. Well, it would be closing, in literally in sonic terms, it would be closing the distance from you and whoever's listening to you. Yeah. So it's just to bring yourself essentially a little bit closer. Yeah. I. I love reverb and that's probably because I'm trying to hide my vocals because I'm still like a little bit insecure. Um, but I also, whenever I really sit and listen to how sound fills up a space, whenever I hear something that's quite dry in a song, I always feel like, like it's a little bit 
unnatural. And maybe that's... I a- love it. I love, like... I love that. I love the... I feel like if you've put a sound in there, like, it should be that sound. Mm. And very, like, unashamedly there. And But then again, it depends on the feel that you want to have. I think some songs, like, for instance, have a song called Hail that's a bit more dreamy and has more reverb than pretty much all the songs on the album. But it's that emotion that I want to have. I want to have that dream-like kind of state. Mm. But I think some of the songs are my vocals like so reassured and like um not really confident but it it's very strong like I think I'm singing on some of the songs very hard so to me naturally it felt to pull back on the reverb on my vocal just so that you have the clarity Mm. and the force of my voice more so I think it's amazing how you can use it as a tool to like evoke emotion and just like as a landscape Mm. to like just have the world of like this kind of like wet kind of I don't know flow I guess I think it's really it's really nice when it's used effectively yeah because reverb actually annoys me most of, sometimes I listen to songs and I'm like I really wish it was less reverb on this vocal like or I really wish this sound had less reverb on it really or like for instance in the new Tom York record he used reverb really well on like I think it's the opening track where the snare is like really verby and then it like for like the first I don't know 30 seconds of the song and then suddenly the entire kit is really really dry so I love when like it has like a journey and is like wet in some places and then like dry again but yeah I don't know I'm less and less a fan of reverb I love it I like to feel like I'm in a perpetual state of intoxication like Tame Impala that I just absolutely love the soundscape the fluidity that when it's used right and it's tight not just like loose weekendy type old weekendy yeah. type stuff when it's real tight and it's adding to the the vibe and yeah like not detracting from it it's probably like my favourite it's so grand like you know when you get into a big space and you're just like you just shout and then the echo fills up the room. It's like there's a majesty in it, which is, again, a tool, if that's what you're trying to create. Yeah, I think it's more emotive. Mm. Like, but yeah. More emotive to... It's more, I think it, it's more emotive in terms of like um, how it can be used. Mm. So I think that's maybe why... I don't know. I think if if a song is very confident, for instance, I have this song called Slate that's literally just drums and vocals and bass for most of it. And at first, when we were mixing it, it w- my vocal had reverb on it, and you ha- like the only thing you could hear was the reverb, and it really annoyed me. And my vocals like so kind of aggressive. Well, not aggressive, but it's very self assured, and the song is so naked that it felt unnatural. Mm. But I think it's interesting because I use reverb in the most vulnerable parts of my vocal. So like um, in that same song where it drops to um, BPM in the mid late, it has the most reverb in the song because I think the lyric I say is like, I get down on myself. Like I feel really like low sometimes. And then, you know, at that moment to me, it reverb adds a vulnerability. Okay. Because it creates so, distance. Yeah. But I love it. I love it when I listen to a record and people are like very brazen with the fact that fuck it, I'm not going to put that much reverb on this sound. Yeah. And it it they're like bold about it, which is probably why I like use this to be honest because I feel like it's a lot of sounds that are like very hard and crunchy that yeah. I think aren't necessarily that verby. And he's definitely angry in the whole album. He's That's something like... I've noticed with his last three projects, actually, is just how dry his vocal is on absolutely everything. Although the, the, the most recent one almost sounds like he recorded it on an iPhone. His It does, his, yeah. his, his vocal sounds not great on yeah. any of the songs. Um, but one thing I have been able to appreciate about the last three projects is how brave he's been with how dry a lot of the stuff is. And I do think that's a, a very subtle culture shift that he's had. Because um, I can't really think of too many people that have done the same. I feel like it's a very brave thing to do. 
I feel like if you're going to shout um, about corporations and saying that they can't control you, like, why would you add reverb on it? <laughs> like, you can't, do you know what I mean? It has to be bold and like, yeah, so I think, abrasive. Yeah. So I think I like to use it as like a emotive device. And who's to say? I don't know. I feel like at the moment in my head, I'm already writing my sec, my not second album, my fourth record. Um, and I have like a kind of title. Um, but I don't know. I feel like my next project might be a bit more dreamy. Mm. Whereas this album is definitely like very in your face <laughs> and very like, this is how I feel like, you know, and it's very dry and like hard hitting. And when's it coming out? Next year. I mean, I don't have released it yet, but next year. How's everything going with the release? Or, or the, the, the final? Well, it's kind of still like early days. It was really cool to put a single out this year. And I think I'm kind of like thinking about what's next kind of a thing. But I think this record to me feels like, I don't know, it's my boldest record yet, for sure. And I think it's very unhinged and it sounds like now, I think it's very like, I think to the brink to me emotionally feels like how I think a lot of people feel right now, this kind of, I don't know, inner, I don't know, means of like rebelling, I don't know, or just like being vocal. I think we're the most vocal, like, Gen like Jeremy I think we're so well not necessarily the most vocal I think we just have more like mediums to say mm. things on more platforms than ever I think you know in the civil rights movements with the like Black Panthers or whatever if they had Twitter you know I'm sure there would be a crazy hashtag movement too so I think maybe it's just the, the mediums that we have and our accessibility to hear what other people say um appears to make it seem like we're um like very vocal about stuff a lot more but um I don't know I think it's my responsibility in a sense to really I don't know be honest about that feeling and to just let it happen even if it scares me a bit or other people around me <laughs> well, I feel like that's been the theme of the conversation is stepping into that fear and on a daily basis reminding yourself that as scary as it may be something lay on the other side of it yeah but as well as like a lot of people might not believe in it around you so that's also a massive challenge how do you convince well not convince someone how you know when you're being yourself and people don't necessarily get it straight away you know um so that's also a challenge as well making music and you know like showing it to people for the first time and them kind of being reintroduced to you in a way mm. sonically and musically I think is what is challenging and I think a lot of people um try and grasp how did like a Frank Ocean go from channel orange to blonde you know sonically things will always change and I'm gonna change endlessly and this is just another chapter in that kind of um me evolving my evolution as an artist so I think it's like I think it's really exciting I, I really I really like it so I think I've done my job <laughs> I love the first I like the record well that's good as long as you like it it doesn't matter what anybody else says yeah because I think that's the massive thing people forget it's like and my friend said this in like a very harsh way it's like people people don't care and they just move on with their lives in a sense like I have to make sure this record, like, at the end of the day, this record is like, has to be for me before it is for anyone, like for anyone else. And, you know, people move on to their life. People will listen to other records after this. So why are you so, why would you even be so obsessed with, um, you know, someone else's gaze before your own? Mm. And it has to be rewarding for me. And first so I think that's the biggest thing I have to ask myself do I feel am I like happy am I does this album feel like it represents me right now and I think it does I think it represents me and I think it's I think it's really exciting and I hope that 
it translate to other people and I can continue to tell the story. Well, I mean, it sucks for everyone watching. They're going to have to wait at least three months to even <laughs> hear it <laughs> after that glowing uh, summary of what it's going to be. But um, I think that's a perfect place to wrap up the conversation. And when the project's out, we should revisit it, do a little track by track. Yeah. And uh, hear it in all of its glory and pick it apart. Yeah. And I love that. And you can look at it from wherever you are in four months and be like, oh, I remember that person who made that record. <laughs> And you'll be a couple of months deep into your own restaurant in Brixton, which I'm sure we'll all be at at some point. Um, I hope so. <laughs> but thank you so much for coming and chatting to me. It's no, always a pleasure you. to pick your brain. Thank you very much. Sweet. Okay, now I need a wee. All right. <laughs>